Among the things that Xenophanes said was that um, athletics and athletes are greatly overrated, um, that they don't deserve all the fuss they get, and that they don't contribute nearly as much to society as poets and philosophers. Um, I don't want to say that, but I am going to give a talk about competition uh, which has nothing to do, or very little to do, rather, with athletics. Um, at the, uh, all the official events uh, within the framework of the great festival of Zeus at Olympia were athletic and uh, were uh, all, of course, competitive. Displays of intellectual and poetic prowess also took the opportunity to attract an audience, but they were unofficial and, so far as we know, not competitive. At the Pythian Festival, however, there were musical contests as well as athletic, going back at least to the 7th century. And the Homeric Hymn to Apollo tells of displays at Apollo's festival on Delos, displays of boxing and dancing and poetry are oidere. Um, and the funeral games where Hesiod won his tripod uh, at Chalcis, uh, somewhere around 700, uh, presumably at those funeral games there were competitions for both athletics and poetry. But a question that I haven't seen raised is this, when and where were the first festivals at which the official contests were exclusively musical and or poetic, without any admixture of athletics whatsoever? Uh, there are various possible candidates at Sicyon, for example, even at Sparta. And I'd be very interested, somebody may be able to offer uh, some early example of a, um, a poetry-only uh, com competition but the first certain occasion that I'm aware of was at Athens, not long before 500, because the only events that took place within the framework of the great city Dionysia were four days' worth of dipholam and of tragedy. So it's possible, at least, even probable, that the Athenians, at the same time as inventing this amazing new art form, the amazing new art form of impersonated storytelling, they also invented the Athletics Free Festival. Forerunner, one might say, of Salzburg, Edinburgh, Hay on Wye, even. Performances of such length and complexity called for huge efforts of organization and huge expense as well, as Peter Wilson has recently quantified. I mean, if Peter's calculations are right, something like 10% of the annual expenditure on the military. 10% of that amount was spent on the great Dionysia alone, which, of course, translated into modern terms is completely uh, astonishing. Um, Robin Osborne has highlighted that the dramatic competitions were inaugurated within a competition culture and that competition was of the essence from the start. And um, we wonder when the didascalia, you know, the official records, so-and-so was first with such and such plays, so-and-so was the Choreagos and so on. Um, when did the didascalia begin to be kept? They seem to have existed right back uh, to the earliest days of the festival. Um, and they emphasized that aspect, the competition aspect. And there's good evidence that theater performances at the Lenaia and at the rural Dionysia the Dionysia catacombas, were uh, competitive as well. An epigraphic testimony for these competitions and for their corrigic arrangements go back into the 5th century. And those also actually consumed very considerable organizational uh, energies and financial expenditure. And I think we're, we're coming to see that the rural Dionysia were very far from kind of village fates um, and um, rustic festivities but were highly organized and sophisticated events. Now, the topic I'm raising today against this background is the connection between festival competitions and the spread of theater beyond Athens and Attica. The spread of theater has been the subject of increasing interest in recent years. And Eric Chapeau's uh, excellent book, Actors and Icons, has made the case for its centrality to the larger picture of Greek theater history. And this move outwards from Athens uh, and out from, from uh, Athenian exclusivity is also the subject of another volume, um, Theatre Outside Athens, uh, edited by Kate Bosher, that's to be published by Cambridge University Press in the next few weeks. I don't, my, Michael Sharp, I think, didn't know the exact date, but it's, it's pretty soon. Sorry it isn't on the table. 
Uh, I contributed a chapter to that volume, Theatre Outside Athens, and I discussed there what I argue must be a missing link in the whole story, and that is troops of travelling players, troops of travelling actors. A missing link because of the dearth of evidence for them before about 300. It's the attempt to pin down something about these elusive travelling players that's led me to this topic of competitive festivals beyond Attica. So I'm going to start at the later end of the period in question. From the great area of the great era rather of the technetai of the artists, which begins around the end of the fourth century, we've a mass of evidence, mainly but not exclusively epigraphic. Evidence about competitive occasions, about fees to cover expenses, and about fabulously lavish prizes. And these dramatic competitions along with a variety of other kinds of performance, were held at a range of different festivals and celebratory occasions. And I'll just home in on one particular inscription um, found at Tegia, Tegia, uh, mid-third century epitaph for an actor, and it gives some particularly nice detail because it includes the titles of some plays by Euripides and by other playwrights in which this actor, unfortunately we don't know his name, in which he starred. And it says, in addition to 88 victories at unspecified Agonas Scanicus, so at, uh, in addition, 88 unspecified um, theatrical competitions, <coughs> it tells us he was also uh, victorious, and this is where the, the plays are named. I'll, I'll miss the names of the plays out. Um, he was victorious at the Athenian Dionysia. Interesting that's put first the Soteria at Delphi, the Ptolemaia at Alexandria, the Heraia at Argos, and the Naia of Zeus held at Dodona. Actually, it reminds me a bit of some passages in Pindi, you know, where uh, a, a kind of backlist of victories at various festivals around the place are sort of catalogued. So that epitaph gives a kind of snap picture from two centuries after the earliest spread uh, from the Athenian Dionysia, what, what happened in between. Well, the very earliest performances outside Athens that we know of were, once again, the work of Hieron of Syracuse, um, pushing the, uh, trying to show that uh, Sicily was not, uh, as Chris called it, fringe. Um, they were Aeschylus's Ait Nai and Aeschylus's Persians that were put on in Sicily under Hieron's patronage. Now, Eric Chapeau, in his book, supposes that they were mounted at, I quote, a regular festival in Syracuse. I think he implies a regular sort of competition. But that, there must be at least a possibility, <coughs> excuse me, that they were not that, but, uh, but one-off commissions. Um, on the other, so maybe the Ait Nai, particularly the Ait Nai, which uh, was very um, occasion-specific, but maybe also the Persians, which is a kind of reprise of the Athenian um, production. Um, maybe they were one-off commissions, maybe they were at festivals, but what we do have some uh, Sicilian uh, evidence towards competitive festivals uh, in the period. Um, there's a, a fifth century curse tablet from Gala, quite recently published, uh, which is concerned with corrigate rivalries. Now we don't know quite what genre those corrigate rivalries were in, but it's worth remembering that that's where Aeschylus died and that um, um, performances were held at his tomb, possibly in a sort of on something quite like a hero cult. And in one of Epicharmus's comic dramas put on at Syracuse, it, it included the words, quote, the decision rests on the knees of the five judges. So uh, that must have come from a competitive setup, although I don't think we know whether it was a festival of Dionysus, um, not necessarily a festival of Dionysus. Um, Barbara Kowalczyk, for example, has recently suggested that uh, possibly drama in Sicily was put on um, under the auspices of Demeter rather than uh, Dionysus. Otherwise, we've got rather little evidence from the 5th century, a couple of anecdotes which I, I will have to uh, go over because of the guillotine, um, before we come to something a bit more solid, which is Archelaus of Macedon, of the same family, of course, as Alexander we've been hearing about. Uh, at the end of the century. Euripides composed an Archelaus about uh, this Archelaus's mythical Argive ancestor and about the foundation of Aigai. 
Now, we don't know, simply don't know, I don't think, uh, whether this was originally part of a competitive festival or whether it was a special one-off piece. Though it's interesting that it was actually a speciality of that actor from Tegia. Two of the victories in that uh, epitaph are with that very play. <coughs> um, so, either way, whatever the, the occasion of the first production of Archelaus, um, we do hear, both from Orion and from Diodorus, that artistic and theatrical competitions at Scanicus Agonas were held by Alexander, by Alexander the Great, at Dion, and possibly at Aigai, following precedents set up by, um, uh, by the, this Archelaus, by the Euripidean Archelaus. And these festivals were Olympia, in, in honor of Zeus, and Musaia, obviously in honor of the Muses. And when you come to think it, both the Olympia and the Musaia for Scenicus Agonos are, are appropriate when we're in the land of Mount Olympus and of the of Pieria, the Pierian Muses. And this is confirmed by Demosthenes' account, <coughs> excuse me, of the celebrations that Philip held after his conquest of Olynthus in 348. Demosthenes tells how Philip held an Olympia and assembled all the professional performers, spantas tu technitas sun ergagen. And this evidently must have included theatrical competitions because Demosthenes goes on about the crowning of the victors and tells a story about Satyrus, the comic actor. So, comedy as well as tragedy and actors as well as playwrights. So there were dramatic festivals held in honour of other gods. And actually that's quite an interesting topic because it raises how uh, quintessential Dionysus is to, to drama. There were dramatic festivals in favor of other gods and, and of potentates, indeed, like the Ptolemy, uh, apart from Dionysus. Nonetheless, scattered evidence from the 4th century still points to the Dionysia, or to Dionysia festivals, as being the main occasion for theater outside Attica as well as inside Attica. Most notably, there's a passage in Plato's Republic where Socrates is uh, criticizing the Philotheomenes, you might have uh, the... Uh, um, uh, performance spectacle hunters uh, who rush around following the Dionysia, as Plato says, in both the villages and cities. And cities, plural, must mean uh, beyond um, Athens and Attica. Um, and um, so Plato does think of Dionysia as being the main occasion for theatre, uh, outside Attica as well as inside. Um, and whether the festivals were for Dionysus or for some other uh, cult, uh, what I think is pretty much uh, beyond doubt is that festivals which did include theatre were uh, competitive, whether they were, uh, wherever they were in the Greek world. And there is a passage in the laws, in Plato's laws, which brings this out rather nicely in an explicit way. This passage criticizes, quote, the practice in Sicily and Italy these days the nomos en Italia kai Sicilia nun. Uh, that nomos is the nomos of deciding the contest by popular acclaim. You know, by, it's like um, phonians, you know, for uh, talent shows. Um, the law says that, that what they do in Sicily and Italy uh, by popular acclaim is really bad news. It compares unfavorably with a good old Greek practice of putting the issue in the hands of a small panel of judges. Now, in the earliest stages of the spread of drama, which, as I say, is a kind of missing link chapter in our history of Greek theater, and an important chapter, but without evidence, there may have been, to start with, one-off invitations. In fact, when you come to think of it, it seems quite likely that in the early days, a city which decided it wanted to host this spectacular new genre of theater, which is getting such amazing press throughout the Greek world, um, they would invite a single company of actors to come on and put a showpiece on for them. That's how it got started. But it's likely that it soon became standard practice for cities to announce competitive occasions. And they no doubt also announced attractive inducements and prizes. And so what you will have got is competitions between competitions. So people say, you know, if you're, if you're absolutely 
five-star troupe of actors come to our festival of whoever it is and put on your plays in our festival. Meanwhile, somebody else is holding a festival and the two are uh, incompatible. There isn't enough time to travel between them. Um, they will both be competing. So competition between competitions. And we've got evidence from the third century when we start getting these big inscriptions about the technetai of very expensive measures uh, recorded on stone being taken to ensure that the most prestigious players did in fact turn up. You know, you've booked your megastar and you, you draw up a big contract to make damn sure that megastar turns up and doesn't um, desert you in favor of some, some other competition. So the escalating bids for prestige and accompanying material rewards will have contributed to the growing celebrity cult in the acting profession and to the immense wealth of the leading stars. And that already goes back well into the, into the fourth century. These immensely powerful and well-rewarded actors. It remained true that the most successful playwrights and the most successful performers gravitated to Athens for the most prestigious events. It was, kind of, it was Athens where you made your reputation. But it's striking what a high proportion of the actors and a pretty high proportion of the playwrights were of non-Athenian origin. Already in the fourth century, they were drawn from all over the scattered Greek world. So playwrights and actors became a bit like uh, athletes in that they were drawn from every corner. Well, finally, yep, I'm within time. Um, according to my clock, Chris, that's right. I think I've been going for a quarter of an hour. I've just got sort of five minutes uh, to add a, an iconographic um, afternote. Um, a few vases. Uh, fourth century vases from the Greek West of the sort that I explored in my book, Pots and Plays, because I think they may reveal some indirect evidence of theatrical competitions. And what I've got in mind is the occasional inclusion of tripods that are not easily explained in any other way. So how do I get the picture started? Great. Uh, and I want my little pointer. Okay. So obviously you expect tripods at Delphi. There, not, that's the... Uh, the death of Neoptolemus, nice Pindaric uh, occasion. Um, you expect tripods at Delphi, you expect tripods in a scene with the prophetic uh, Cassandra here, going into prophetic swoon. Uh, we were talking about seers this morning, Olga was talking about seers, there's a, a Hellenus, a seer there. Um, you might well expect tripods in this scene that reflects Oedipus at Colonus, um, because they might well just be symbols of the sacred grove that is the setting of the play. You see the blind, the blind Oedipus, the two daughters, these two um, tripods on pillars. But there are at least three vases that um, have a pair of tripods on pillars that frame the composition on either side without any evident bearing on the subject of the scene between them. The earliest is this um, Apulian calyx crater of about 350. Uh, actually, there are name, quite a lot of name inscriptions, and so we know it's the story of Parthenopios. Um, and as you see, um, there are these tripod pictures, on, uh, tripod uh, pillars on both sides, long, thin pillars that stretch up the entire length of the calyx crater picture. Um, and it's the same on this crater from some 20 years later, where you see they, get, they actually even um, slightly encroach on the frame at the top, uh, this, uh, um, I, I think I can make a strong case for saying that what we have here is, is a scene involving Phaedra and Hippolytus, but um, I haven't got time to go into that unless, of course, if you want to come back to it, um, I'd be delighted, but, um, but that would be self-indulgent. Um, and thirdly, this must be familiar to you, it's one of the most famous and monumental of all, uh, it's a volute crater in Munich, which dates from um, around 320. It's a pr pretty gigantic and over-the-top piece. Um, and it gives an elaborate um, narration of Medea's infanticide. There's Medea killing one of her sons. Um, lots of name labels, I think there are something like 14 name labels, including the ghost of Aetes, uh, Adolon, um, of uh, Medea's father, 
and including a son who is escaping as well as the son who is being murdered. Um, clearly, I think, um, unarguably, um, a post-Euripidean version of the Medea story. Now, here there are two tripod pillars, there and there. They don't stretch the entire length of the picture, but, of course, if they went the whole way from the top and the bottom of this enormous picture, the thing as a whole is something like um, 1 meter 30 high. I mean, that's higher than this, um, than this lectern. Um, they couldn't stretch the whole length. They would then be absurdly uh, elongated. Now, it's an open question whether there were ever pre-commissioned vase paintings. And, and most art historians tend to be sceptical that there ever were, that you could ever actually specially get a bespoke vase painting for, the, say, for the, uh, for the funeral of a particular, of a particular individual. Um, and, of course, it may have been different by the time we're into the later 4th century in um, Apulia, where we get these particularly elaborate and enormous and no doubt very uh, no doubt expensive pieces. Um, but I think that the, between them, these three tripod frames, uh, framed pictures that I've been showing you, do add up to a possible case for pieces that were specially commissioned to celebrate victories in theatrical competitions. And if that were right, then their provenance, of course, would be rather interesting. Supposing they were specially commissioned for the person in whose tomb they are, that could tell us something about uh, the uh, cultural and economic uh, situation. But um, unfortunately, we know the provenance of only one of these three that I've been showing you, and it is this one. And this was excavated in 1813 at Canosa. Now, Canosa is a wealthy uh, Dornian or Pucatian settlement near the northern coast of Apulia, northwest of Bari, a town, that is, where the first language was not Greek. Would that suggest that Greek drama competitions were held in Italian, in Italian communities, in communities whose first language was not Greek, though the second language would be? That may sound pretty implausible, but actually I don't think the possibility should be too hastily ruled out. But if I try to go into that, then I really will go beyond the guillotine. Thank you. <laughs>